Thank you. So title of presentation, again, from natural science to spiritual science. And uh, I'm very happy to introduce Florian Saido from Anthroposophical Society in Hawaii. Florian uh, serving as uh, vice chairman for many, many years for the Anthroposophical Society. And he is founding member of Kahumana community. He is also about 30 years in uh, organic architecture and construction. So, and uh, I will show some slides uh, from Kahumana community, which is amazing. It's, uh, it's landed in uh, uh, crater of volcano. This is uh, island of Oahu, Hawaii again. And uh, we can see, uh, we will see some examples of uh, uh, Florian's creativity, as well as uh, Akridge of, um, of Kahumana. Florian, uh, if yes, you will, yes. I mean, can you give some comments? Um, okay, more okay. people are coming. Let me just admit them, admitting all. Okay, great. They're coming. And uh, again, it's Kahumana community, island Oahu, Hawaii. Yeah, it's Kahumana with a K-A. Sorry about it, so I'm Russian. <laughs> so this was uh, yeah, a this tour is... on uh, the farm uh, on the 14 and a half acre parcel. Uh, there's kind of a, uh, mountains in the background that are a sort of semicircle. We're looking east. Yes, pretty dramatic view. Huge mountains. They are um, uh, making certain uh, circle around uh, around volcano crater. So whole Kahumana community is in the crater of Vol Vulcan, Volcano. It's like an ancient caldera, which is a large, uh, had smaller volcanoes inside of it. With some views. There is uh, a fruits of a uh, bread tree. So uh, you can see mangoes. So community also producing mangoes, uh, salad and um, uh, bread tree fruits. What else, uh, Florian? Uh, they grow a lot of vegetables, uh, especially salads, et cetera. Uh, that uh, are on the market uh, or for pickup at uh, uh, on a weekly basis. Yeah, and here is uh, a chapel inside of community. Lauren, can you tell us all about? Road Chapel. Yeah, this is uh, a chapel that was built uh, in the early 80s. I uh, kind of designed it a little bit as a, a ship uh, that's traveling the cosmic ocean as opposed to the earthly. And the uh, altar is where the rudder would be. Uh, that's uh, in this case in the west. And heading east. And uh, I worked on this uh, design uh, using a lot of recycled materials in the structural part, but there's a lot of sort of curving uh, of the walls of the structure. Mm -hmm. He 
these are the doors. Uh, Virginia Brett, uh, who lived with us, she was a eurythmist, curative eurythmist, and speech teacher from Dornach. And uh, she designed this. A friend from Sri Lanka did the copper hammering work. That's an outside uh, view. It's attached to a uh, residence on the other side. This is uh, one of uh, uh, three buildings that are put in a clover leaf. And uh, this is called the Star House. It has a five pointed star with a cross through it up at the upper floor, which was an anthroposophical uh, room. Uh, this was sort of uh, where our family lived uh, when we were uh, all out there. And uh, a lot of this involves recycled uh, military barracks. Yeah, so this is the anthroposophical mm -hmm. room where the library is located. This is uh, the middle, middle wing. Uh, you can see the walls are kind of leaning out, which gives this depth to the windows and the door frame. And we did, uh, we fabricated all the doors and, and windows on site uh, in a small, small shop. And so the building has been around for quite a while. So there's some disrepair. <laughs> should be some further work uh, done. That's the middle wing straight ahead and then the uh, left wing. Yeah, that's the uh, east, the west wing. This is uh, upstairs uh, in the uh, middle wing. There's a Eurythmy room up there. Okay, yeah, I guess, no, this is uh, actually the other side of the star room. Some people were staying there. This, uh, yeah, this is the end of uh, the middle wing, I believe, downstairs. This is the, the west wing. This window was meant to express the seven fold as opposed to the five fold on the uh, star house uh, building. So it's meant to have to do with movement. Uh, seven governs time. So the window is meant to express that. This is the back of the east wing. Uh, up above, instead of the angular windows, they are rounded. This was sort of an art room uh, for my wife uh, years back. That's a Christophorus uh, sculpture that's behind the main house.
Yeah, this is uh, area where the agriculture uh, folks uh, work to uh, gather the vegetables and process them before they ship out. You know, they have some uh, aquaculture there as well. Uh, Florian, is it right? This is tree of Budhi, which is grown out of original. Uh, yeah, this is a Bodhi tree. It uh, was a seed uh, from a tree that had originally uh, been from the Bodhi tree that is considered the tree under which Buddha had his enlightenment. And we, we planted it uh, there from seed. So let's say this is original child of uh, original tree. Okay. Yes, I mean because I mean it's it's so amazing because it's uh, it's uh, it's grown out of seed of tree original tree, where Gautama Bodhisattva reached his Buddhahood. You've got his enlightenment. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Now, this is in the same area, uh, Buddha sculpture. There are some flow forms in the area as well. Uh, dancing Shiva that someone uh, placed there in, on the way out to this Mandala garden area. And this is the end. Yeah, thank you so much, Fleur. And now we can probably start our presentation. So is the first slide uh, showing? Yep. Yes, uh -huh. you're good. Okay. Yeah, so this is this uh, is a subject I've been working with uh, for quite some time, and there's more than we can cover in the time we have available, but at least uh, could uh, get a start on this. Has primarily to do with technology and the challenges that we're facing on the level of humanity as a whole. I think uh, Rudolf Steiner gave many very important uh, indications regarding this world of technology and the subnature forces that primarily uh, power these machines. And Rudolf Steiner gives credit to many others for his own development. And among them are these philosophers, uh, poets like Novalis, and he mentions uh, Fichte, Hegel, Schelling, and of course Goethe played an important role. Uh, these sculptures were there at the Munich Congress. Uh, however, the Novalis sculpture wasn't available. And uh, Goethe was so much a part that uh, it wasn't necessary to have a sculpture of him there. This is just a, a little bit of a biographical timeline of uh, some of Rudolf Steiner's uh, work. Uh, up to uh, 1910. And Rudolf Steiner had early clairvoyant experiences. 
but unlike many who take this in a mystical direction, he became a trained scientist, but he also had uh, help from the level of the spiritual world. One of them uh, was this herb gatherer, Felix Kagutsli, Kagutsky, that uh, we've uh, gotten some help from the Christian community priest, Emil Bach, who researched and wrote about uh, this person and his family. And then there was another master uh, that he met at age 19, 1879, which was the beginning of the new Michael age. So one can see in Rudolf Steiner's biography that he was attuned to this Michael rulership which was then shifting from the level of archangel, as he describes, to the level of our chi, which means of a planetary level that has an important impulse for this entire fifth post-Atlantean age. And at the bottom is the work that's related more to his period when he became the general secretary of the German Theosophical Society up to his writing of uh, and publishing of an outline of occult science, which gives an overview of his uh, cosmology and spiritual science in general. This is meant to show the sweep of evolution from the beginning of the Kali Yuga, the so-called Dark Age or Iron Age, which began in 3101 BC, according to Rudolf Steiner. And then the intellectual Greco-Latin Soul Age, which is the fourth post-Atlantean age. And then our contemporary Consciousness Soul Age, the fifth post-Atlantean age. Now, what I'm trying to show here is uh, incarnations of Lucifer, Christ, and Ariman, three uh, incarnations that Steiner uh, spoke of as being related to one another. Lucifer in China uh, around 2698, if one uh, trusts the research of some who identify this as the yellow emperor. And uh, this Luciferic incarnation gave a very powerful impulse that continued uh, into the Greco-Latin age and helped to nurture the Gnostic wisdom that was still alive at the time of the mystery of Golgotha. Now, the middle of the Greco Latin Age, which spans from 747 BC to 1432 AD or 1413 AD, is 333. And Rudolf Steiner indicated that the Christ gave his impulse in 33 AD that changed the whole aura of the earth. This is the mystery of Golgotha. In order to prepare the earth for its future development of the planet of love, the future sun earth, the golden city that's spoken of in the book of Revelation. But it was also a means of counterbalancing the dark and negative impulse that was to come from Zorat, the sun demon, in 666 AD. This is the number of the beast spoken of in the book of Revelation. So this was kind of a counterbalancing of that impulse that was to come later and endanger human evolution by bringing the consciousness soul impulse prematurely 
before humanity was ready to really meet it. And then we have in our time an approaching incarnation of Ariman. And I have a few quotes here regarding this uh, from Rudolf Steiner. Before only a part of the third millennium has elapsed, there will be in the West an actual incarnation of Ariman. Ariman's incarnation will occur in the not too distant future. This time is approaching. Ariman will appear. Among the most important means which Ariman has to work with from the other side is the furthering of abstract thinking in the human being. Here I'm kind of uh, pointing to that first intervention of the sun demon in the year 666. And one needs to understand these interventions not as just that year 666, but rather an epicenter in time. Just like when you have an earthquake, you have a shock wave that moves in all directions. One could say that there was a foreboding of this 666 and an afterworking of this 666. And Baghdad, which became a center for Islam, uh, which was in a certain respect a recapitulation of the old father god that had appeared in the Jewish Hebrew tradition. Only now it was in the post-Christian time when the sun impulse had taken hold. And so this whole impulse of Islam played an important role in dulling down the impulse of Gundi Shapur, which is where the Zorat impulse gave a powerful influence. Uh, there were many initiates who migrated to Gundi Shapur after being ousted uh, from other mystery centers in Persia and also uh, the Platonic Academy uh, was closed down. And uh, so there were many wise individuals who migrated there. But the Zorat being tends to prey on such highly intelligent human beings and worked in Gundi Shapur. And this influence, as I said, was dulled and diminished by the rise of Islam around this same time. And uh, Caliph Harun al-Rashid played an important role in launching the golden age of Islam. And he founded an intellectual center, a great library and center of learning in Baghdad. And from there, it spread out to other places. There was, uh, it's called the House of, of Wisdom. And there was a family, the Barmakids, who had served uh, numerous of these Abbasid colleagues. Uh, Harun al-Rashid was the fifth in that dynasty. And they brought uh, the Persian religion, which was a sun religion, into this impulse of Islam, which was a moon religion, a lunar religion. And at a certain point, 
Harun al Rashid had his vizier, which is Jafar ibn Yahya Barmaki, uh, he had him executed along with the rest of his family. And so this can be seen as an anti grail impulse, just like you had with John the Baptist, where his head was delivered to King Herod on a silver charger, the silver being related to the moon forces, only in this case, it's the backward moon forces that work against the sun forces. And Rudolf Steiner indicated that this individuality, Harun al-Rashid later reincarnated as Francis Bacon. And this impulse of the sun demon also reached into the eighth ecumenical council that was held in the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, which has since become a mosque. There were many things in 879 that took place, or 869, I'm sorry, including a council in the spiritual world where Aristotle and Alexander, who were between death and rebirth, met with the souls of Harun al-Rashid and one of his primary counselors in the spiritual world and hoped to influence them in a positive direction, but it didn't take hold. This is a picture related to the Royal Society, which Francis Bacon is seen as the father of the Royal Society. This is the reincarnated Harun al-Rashid. Harun al-Rashid had about eight wives and uh, up to 200 uh, slave girls in his harem so that uh, these women were kind of walled off in a special compound uh, where a eunuch oversaw them. And some of this uh, sort of relationship to the feminine sort of carried over into this impulse of the Royal Society where women were not uh, welcome. The Royal Society was founded in 1660, but it wasn't until 1945 that uh, woman, uh, women began to be allowed to enter. And Isaac Newton uh, played an important role in the Royal Society as well. And he, uh, was of course the father of this impulse of gravity. I have a picture of him under the tree with the apple uh, falling. And I kind of wrote there, Newton's gravitational theory formulates what causes the apple to fall, but leaves out the more difficult question of how the apple got up there in the first place which is more of a life question. This would require an understanding of the etheric and the levity forces. And of course, his color theory, Newton's color theory was based one-sidedly on light, white light left out the importance of darkness, which Goethe sought to rectify in his color theory. Rudolf Steiner shows uh, that there were 12 philosophical vantage points and uh, modern science basically includes rationalism, mathematism, materialism, you could say sensationalism is in there, but tends to leave out uh, the others. And inside the circle, you have different ways of working with these vantage points. And basically, logicism and empiricism come to expression in modern science, but the others uh, are left out. Charles Darwin uh, 
was, of course, the person who gave the most powerful impulse in modern science in terms of its understanding of human evolution. But he confessed later in life, quote, I have said that in one respect, my mind has changed during the last 20 or 30 years up to the age of 30 or beyond it. Poetry of many kinds, such as the works of Milton, Gray, Byron, Wordsworth, Calderidge, and Shelley gave me great pleasure. And even as a schoolboy, I took intense delight in Shakespeare, especially in the historical plays. I've also said that formerly pictures gave me considerable and music very great delight. But now for many years, I cannot endure to read a line of poetry. I have tried lately to read Shakespeare and found it so intolerable dull that it nauseated me. I have also lost my taste for pictures or music. Music generally sets me thinking too energetically on what I have been at work on instead of giving me pleasure. My mind seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding general laws out of large collection of facts. But why this should have caused the atrophy of that part of the brain alone of which the higher tastes depend, I cannot conceive. The loss of these tastes is a loss of happiness and may possibly be injurious to the intellect and more probably to the moral character by enfeebling the emotional part of our nature. So in other words, there's consequences for leaving out the realm of feeling, which belongs to the middle realm, the heart realm. And Goethe was both an artist and a scientist who integrated uh, both of these. And Rudolf Steiner, of course, worked uh, with this Goethean impulse. He spent 16 years uh, helping to edit Goethe's scientific work. Here you have a contrast between a spiritual scientific view of human evolution and animal and plant and mineral evolution as opposed to the Darwinian uh, view. And in the case of the human being, according to anthroposophy, there's a descent in this image on the left, it's a recapitulation of the old sun in the Hyperborean, the old uh, moon in the Lemurian. Uh, the earth itself begins with the Atlantean. And the human being descends from above. And the animals are really the first to descend to the earth. Uh, leading up to the mammals, and then finally the human beings who stayed in the sphere around the earth longer in this mother substance, this paradisical uh, condition. The scientific revolution helped to launch the industrial revolution, which in the meantime has gone through several uh, later phases. So we're now in the fourth industrial revolution where mobile, cloud, smart connected device, cyber physical system, smart factory, robots, mass customization and product as service is expressed in this little diagram here. In this fourth industrial age, there are many facets. And these trillion dollar companies I've listed on the left, aside from Aramco, uh, Saudi Arabia, are all related to the tech sphere that has helped to launch this industrial revolution. And these trillion dollar companies are, of course, uh, very much uh, supported through the stock market. On the right-hand side, you have the so-called FANG stocks, uh, which especially benefited during the years of COVID where people were stuck at home and remote working became more of a thing. 
And of course, Facebook uh, renamed itself Meta and is trying to help launch the metaverse. And there's many of these industries that will be contributing to this that I tried to indicate through these arrows that I've added to this. Here's a, a kind of graph that shows how we're moving toward what's being called the singularity which is an acceleration of evolution on the technological level that's said uh, to be growing exponentially. And just to give an idea of exponential growth at the bottom, uh, the lily pond is sometimes used as a metaphor for this. You have a pond of a certain size and upon that pond, a single lily pad this particular species of lily pad reproduces once a day. So that in day two, you have two lily pads. On day three, you have four and so on. If it takes the lily pad 48 days to cover the pond completely, how long will it take for the pond to be covered halfway? The answer is day 47. So this is where humanity is in danger through its linear way of thinking to have this arimonic evolution uh, overwhelm humanity because from day 47 to day 48 in this period, there's a doubling uh, once again. This is just meant to give an image of negative al alchemy as opposed to the positive alchemy that was sought and practiced in the medieval period. And atomic theory led over to this. Rudolf Steiner has said of atomic theory, a great part of what today is called the scientific outlook, not the facts of science, for they can be relied on, consist of nothing else than pictures of the general occult captivity threatening to overtake mankind. The danger lies in the surrounding of people everywhere with atomistic and molecular pictures. It is impossible when surrounded by such pictures to look at those of the free spirit and the stars for the atomic atomistic picture of the world is like a wall around man's soul, the spiritual wall of a prison house. So that we're projecting this materialistic outlook onto the world and it affects the elemental beings. It uh, allows the dragon to devour these elemental beings whom we should be redeeming. Ariman is also invading the life realm and has great ambitions in that regard. So a big step in that direction was the mapping of the genome, which the US government helped to sponsor. More recently, CRISPR is a gene editing technology that uh, shows promise in many areas, some of which are expressed here. The US government has played a big role, not just in uh, the Manhattan Project, which helped to release the first atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, which killed hundreds of thousands of uh, people in a flash, uh, but also the later hydrogen bomb. And the Pentagon is a central hub of US militarism that has been dominating global events uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, which sort of was the end of the Cold War. But we're in the midst of a new Cold War. So here you have the Pentagon. I've added this star and showing that there's an alignment to the White House, which is, of course, the uh, center of the US government, the presidency. And uh, 
and if you look at it from the White House, this star is upside down, which means it's the two-horned beast then at that point. Uh, on Monday, uh, the Artemis America's new moonshot is launching. And this is, uh, uh, the goal is to uh, send this rocket uh, around the moon in preparation to have a manned flight next year. And uh, this is, uh, you know, a replay of uh, the moon missions. Of course, the Russians with Sputnik were the first uh, to launch space probes, et cetera, and that helped to get the space race going. But in the meantime, the US has been in the forefront. The modern scientific worldview has been projected onto the universe, but it's not having a great deal of luck in answering the riddles of the universe. Because modern science is not able to really tell us what dark matter, which makes up around 74% of the scientifically viewed universe, and dark matter is in the same category. We only really, with the help of modern understanding in science, understand this small little percentage, that little pie in yellow, which is considered uh, normal matter, consisting of those elements shown below. And there is, of course, hope uh, with the $10 billion James Webb Space Telescope, which we're starting to see these uh, pictures. Uh, hoping that that will help to solve the riddle. But Rudolf Steiner indicated that this projection of the materialistic worldview on the heavens has brought about the death of Sophia and that we have the task of reawakening her by lifting the veil of the stars, which can't be done materialistically. Now, there's many private aside from the US, which has launched the Space Force, which is a militarization of space. You have the private sector and a leading contender there is SpaceX. Uh, Elon Musk is quite an entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur and also a inventor. Uh, the plan is to aside from the launching of these many Starlink satellites, about 63 of them at a time, I think there's 53 going up today in a launch, but the intention is to eventually have 42,000 of them. And that is supposed to provide internet uh, potential for everywhere on the whole planet. Currently, uh, 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 about 51% of the world population have internet access. So Elon Musk wants to fix that. And on the right, you have this spaceship that's meant to eventually uh, take humanity on a manned trip to Mars, which is a great ambition of Elon Musk. And he's not the only one uh, who's interested in this uh, space colonization. Jeff Bezos, another multi-billionaire founder of Amazon is in the same uh, group of billionaires. And there has been some people pointing to this blue origin spacecraft as resembling a phallic symbol, which is kind of uh, par for the course. So Luciferic pride uh, is leads over to Ariman. And 
in the present time, humanity is going through a critical stage of collectively crossing the threshold. And this has to do with the challenge to reconnect with the soul spiritual world by preparing the future planet, uh, the new Jerusalem, where spirit self and manas will need to be developed. But a precursor of that is already meant to be developed in the sixth post-Atlantean age. In the sixth letter in the book of Revelation, it is said, I will write on your name, uh, your forehead, a new name, the name of the new Jerusalem. So already then, the sixth age, which is being prepared through anthroposophy and the Slavic and Russian people have that as a mission as well, is uh, what we should be contributing to the future. However, modern science and these technological trends that I've referred to lead downward. And it's when the mystery of evil especially comes to the fore in the number five, the fifth, the post-Atlantean age as a whole is the number five within earth evolution. And we're in the fifth age of this fifth post-Atlantean period. So this is where the attack of the adversarial forces is particularly strong. And the second coming of Christ in the etheric symbolized by this woman standing on the moon, crowned with the stars and clothed with the sun, stands above us at this time, where Steiner indicated that there is the sounding of the seventh trumpet. The sounding of the sixth trumpet began in the 1840s, where humanity began to cross a threshold symbolized by the seal, uh, Rosicrucian seal on the left. But on either side are the two beasts that rise out of the water and the dry land. And under this woman is the red dragon with seven heads and ten horns that harkens back to the Atlantean age when the seven root races were laid down. So there's a danger of regressing back into the root races as a time when we're meant to develop a new community impulse that's cosmopolitan, that embraces the human being regardless of skin color and blood and race. And this dragon is said to cast down a third of the stars, which is the spiritual third of the stars. This is what scientific materialism is doing, is casting down a third of the stars, the spiritual dimension of the stars. The computer can be seen as a sign and outer reflection of the crossing of the threshold. Over here, I meant to speak of the eighth sphere, which is a downward evolutionary impulse that Lucifer and Ariman seek to engender at the expense of the progressive evolution. And this is really outside of the progressive seven stages of world evolution outlined in occult science and outline. And this is the danger that we face. So here, I wanted to just say that the computer can be seen as a sign, outward sign of the crossing of the threshold. And one can also perceive a progression in the departure from the physical in the shift from wired to wireless technologies. However, the threshold crossing tends to be in the downward direction into the depths of the abyss rather than an ascent towards reestablishing a connects, connection to the hierarchies. In his description of the adversarial attacks aimed at drawing human beings into the eighth sphere, Steiner emphasized that they are most successful in the head and human thinking. The internal counterpart to the protective moon fortress, which protects us from the eighth sphere up to a certain point uh, in the heavens, 
which acts as a bulwark against the threat posed by the eighth sphere is centered in human sexuality bound to the hereditary forces, which are being intensely magnified as we try to escape from our earthly home into virtual realities. Ray Kurzweil uh, wrote numerous books. One of them is called The Age of Spiritual Machine which provides an intimation of the fact that a counterfeit version of the spiritual is involved in the world of machine intelligence and the internet. There are numerous other contemporary authors who are tending in the same direction, reflected, for example, in the book Electromagnetism and the Sacred at the frontier of spirit and matter. There's other in the same direction that I won't go into here. Here I'm trying to show how in our own time, there's kind of a reflection, a recapitulation of sorts of the third age in this fifth age with the turning point of time being a kind of middle point. And Rudolf Steiner speaks of how in order for this Egypto-Chaldean mystery wisdom to be renewed for our time, an individual representing that age had to be raised from the dead. And this was the youth of nine, who was the reborn youth of Zeiss, according to Rudolf Steiner, who then, after the time of Christ, reincarnated as Mani, who founded the Man Manichaean uh, spiritual impulse. Mani uh, was martyred and his body was hung on the gates of Gundi Shapur, which I've spoken of earlier. Mani reincarnated as Parsival, according to Steiner, in the ninth century. This is the leading initiate of our whole post-Atlantean age. And he is the candidate to become the future Manu in the sixth epoch, a human Manu will take over from the present Manu, who is the 13th in the mother lodge, the great white lodge of the spirits of wisdom and harmony of feeling. So we have each of these is the son of a widow, which is kind of a, a saying related to these initiates. So Parsival is a forerunner of the consciousness soul. The grail itself was given through the mystery of Golgotha, belongs to the fourth age. The knights of the grail represent the carriers of that grail impulse. And the Arthurian knights represent a renewal of the ancient Egyptian star wisdom. So that there were 12 main knights sitting around the the round table uh, representing the 12 constellations of the zodiac and embodying them upon the earth. Arthur represented the sun and Guinevere represented the moon. So you have a humanized cosmos, but you have the black magician Klingsor and his castle of wonders, which is a counterpart to the castle of the grail. And these two castles can be related to the New Jerusalem, the castle of the Grail will metamorphose into that, and the castle of Klingsor into the great city of Babylon. So they are kind of precursors to that. This is trying to show how the Grail moon is related to the Grail secret. And also the Pieta image uh, painted there by Elaine Claude de Herbois. From Rudolf Steiner, let us place before ourselves the mother thought of as a virgin with the Christ on her lap. And let us then make the statement, he who can have feelings of holiness before this image, he feels himself to be standing before the grail the holy chalice, the moon mother, now touched by Christ, the new Eve, bearer of Christ, the sun spirit, outshines all other lights 
all other, other gods. This is taken a picture from the Grail tri triptych, which I've brought forward in other presentations. I just wanted to hear related to the three mothers that are there shown beneath the earth that are brought forward in Goethe's Faust. And Rudolf Steiner spoke repeatedly about the importance of Goethe and his Faust drama. And that uh, he related these three mothers to the old Saturn, old sun, old moon, which were the incarnations prior to the earth of world evolution that humanity underwent incorporated into the earth. And they bring with them backward forces that have in the meantime fallen out of the heights. So electricity is related to one of the mothers as to do with the fallen astral. Magnetism harkens back to the old moon related to Ariman and the fallen lower Devakan. And then you have what he called the third force related to old Saturn and fallen higher Devakan. There's many that relate the third force to nuclear energy and the nuclear force. And one could say that that's the tip of the iceberg. There's much more uh, to it than that. But the grail, which overflows there in the vessel of Joseph Arimathea beneath the cross and steeps into the earth, has a redeeming power a healing power. And the tree that grows out of that uh, cross is the tree of life, which is renewed, that was taken away from humanity at the time of the fall when we ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil under the temptation of Lucifer. But the real grail vessel is really the Nathan Jesus being, who in an esoteric lesson Steiner refers to as the higher self of the human being. This Nathan Jesus was held back at the time of the fall and maintains this connection to the tree of life so that the higher ethers, the life ether and the tone and sound ether the chemical ether, as it's also called, part of those were withdrawn at the time of the fall, but are there within this being of the Nathan Jesus who gave them back to humanity through the mystery of Golgotha. And these new life forces that can restore the human phantom lived in the blood which has been etherized and can be integrated into the human being through the secrets related to the etherization of the blood. In this consciousness soul age, we have the reverberation of the second intervention of Zorat that took place in 1332, where Philip LeBel imprisoned and tortured the Knights Templars and had many of them uh, burned at the stake. And he, you could say, was under the spell of the sun demon who was incorporating in him. But the most powerful attack of the sun demon really is centered around the year 1998. And as I said, this is an epicenter in time. So already in uh, Lenin and Stalin, uh, carried this impulse into Russia. And there it lived in Bolshevism. And later then in Hitler, it found its way into Middle Europe and the great war that uh, resulted uh, from 
Hitler's uh, various uh, empire uh, sort of uh, dreams that he had. And this picture of the super race and this racial aspect, all of this has to do with this Zorat being uh, coming in. And Zorat works through Ariman, uh, Lucifer, and the Azuric beings. Lucifer began to intervene in the Lemurian epoch, Ariman in the Atlantean. In our age, the Zorat being works also through uh, this third and more powerful impulse of evil that has to do with the counterforce to the father. And this then is the progression from Lucifer to Ariman to the Azuric beings. Lucifer attacks the astral body primarily, Ariman, the etheric body, hardening thinking, rigidifying thinking into fundamentalism that you saw in this hardening of the Christian doctrine already in uh, 18 and uh, 869, where the Trinity was uh, replaced by the duality of the human being, that the soul had certain qualities that were spiritual, but didn't have a spiritual part, a threefoldedness was reduced to a two-foldedness. That, according to Steiner, was a continuation of the Gundi Shapur impulse, which has continued into our time to where now the soul also is being extinguished, to where with modern science, we're just a body. The soul forces are just an epiphenomena. And so we have this impulse of Zorat, but we have the imminent incarnation of Ariman, which I've already spoken of. And here are some of the preparations that Ariman makes uh, based on some of Rudolf Steiner's indications. Of course, a lot of these technologies didn't exist that I'm mentioning here. Uh, but I'm gonna uh, share with whoever's interested these uh, copy of these slides. So we don't have time to go through each of these here. The human double is particularly important in this uh, realm because this is a being uh, that unites with the human being just before birth and generally has to leave uh, just before death. And it lives within the bioelectromagnetic forces within the human being. But the greatest frustration of Ariman and Lucifer, who can use this double, this doppelganger as a sheath, is this need to leave just before death. So Ariman seeks to overcome this hindrance. And that's where I believe a lot of this transhumanism and posthumanism comes from as an inspiration. Now, Rudolf Steiner indicated that in preparation for anthroposophy, there was a Michael school in the spiritual world that took place from around the 15th century and culminated in the period from the 18th to the 19th century where there was a great celebration a uh, great ritual cultus kind of event. Uh, while Michael above was teaching his host, there was founded in the realm lying immediately below the surface of the earth, a kind of sub-earthly Arimonic school. The Michael school was in the super earthly world in the region beneath our feet where the spiritual is actively at work in the sub-earthly region also the opposing Arimonic school was founded. And I think it's sort of interesting that Seymour Cray, who was the uh, father of the supercomputer, uh, gives uh, some indication of 
where this inspiration came from. John Rawlings Wagen, Roe Wagen, chairman of Cray Research, tells the story of a French scientist who visited Cray's home in Chippewa Falls, asked what were the secrets of his success. Cray showed his visitor a tunnel that he had built under his house, explaining that when he reached an impasse in the computer design, he would retire to the tunnel to dig. While digging, while I'm digging in the tunnel, the elves will often come to me with solutions to my problems, he said. So anyways, you can see with this exascale supercomputer on the right, which is recently uh, rated as the top in a 500 list, uh, still is related to the Cray impulse. So this overview of human evolution shows that uh, we have the cosmic evolution above the Mantavaras, then we have the Earth stage. We're in the fifth post-Atlantean, shown there in the middle on the right. And then down below, we're seeing the post-Atlantean, and we're seeing how the first four are recapitulations of the past, but the fifth is no longer a recapitulation. It's anticipating the future the future New Jerusalem, the golden city, the future planet of love, which was called uh, the Jupiter condition. So Seiner indicated that this is what makes our time apocalyptic, that we're not recapitulating anymore, we're uh, anticipating the future. And this recent crossing of the threshold is really an anticipation of this pralaya, this crossing from Earth to the Jupiter condition. I just want to emphasize there's one thing, according to Steiner, in human life that they, the double, absolutely cannot endure. They cannot endure death. Therefore, they must always leave this human body in which they have established themselves before that body succumbs to death. This is a very harsh disappointment again and again for just what they want to attain to remain in the human body beyond death is thwarted. To do this would be a lofty achievement in the kingdom of these beings. So I'll leave it at that for the moment. There's more there. So what is then transhumanism and posthumanism? This is really to create a kind of android that the human being could be uploaded into or unite with through the help of the future technologies so that the human being could conquer death. This is really the ambition of Ariman that's being inspired by human beings who are identifying with the double. So the Arimanically inspired transhumanism and posthumanism is an illusion of physical immortality because it's not the human being, it's not the human eye that moves from incarnation to incarnation that would dwell in these android, humanoid, uh, robotic uh, beings, but rather uh, the double that would be scanned and scanned down to uh, each sort of neuron in the human brain and this electrical forces that are related to the synapses and the like. So this is sort of a dark picture of where part of humanity is heading. It's a real danger there. It's happening very rapidly. So this is related to the correspondence between microcosm and macrocosm. Steiner speaks of how we have 18 respirations per minute, which is 25,920 respiration in a day. And we arrive at the same number when we calculate how many days are contained in a normal lifespan of 72 years. And that also gives about 25,920 days so that something may be said 
to exhale our astral body and ego on falling asleep and inhaling again upon awaking, always in conformity with the same number. And this same number comes to expression in the years that it takes for the journey of the sun, uh, the moon, or I should say the moon and the earth around the sun in a platonic year, which takes 25,920 years. Anyway, this is just meant to show the correspondences between microcosm and macrocosm. This is the sculpture as it is now standing in the second Goetheanum. On the right, there's a quote from Peter Selg relating that Rudolf Steiner had intended that this sculpture should have been located in the same position in the second building as it was intended for the first. To me, this is symptomatic having to do with the fact that the anthroposophists have missed this impulse of the mystery of evil in a certain respect, not talking about anthroposophy as a whole, but the Michael impulse is always impulses working against what Michael seeks to bring. And the fact that this was put in a side room rather than in the center of the stage is a symptom of that failing. So this I've shown before, it's the counter uh, subnature and supernature forces, the fallen ethers, and our journey back to a connection with the spiritual world and the New Jerusalem or the descent into the eighth sphere. A division of humanity is beginning in our time. And we're building a global brain, a global nervous system. This is related to what's called the emerging new sphere that various scientists like Vladimir Verdansky, a Russian scientist, Pierre Tyler de Chardin, have spoken about, as well as Edouard Leroy. And the Gaia theory also contributes to this picture. But we're caught between these etheric and fallen etheric forces of electricity and these magnetic and gravitational forces aside from the etheric and the astral and the spiritual forces. So we're caught in this polarity and modern science is leaning us heavily in the direction of the subnature forces. And this affects our identity. So we have an opportunity with the help of anthroposophy to re-enliven and spiritualize thinking and raise it up into imaginative consciousness, inspirational and intuition and reunite uh, with the higher beings. And the other is to descend. And that's where these computer developments and the whole thrust of posthumanism and transhumanism are leading downward into the sub nature world. I've shown this picture before so that the head again in this picture represents the eighth sphere. And this is where we're physically incarnated. We have an opportunity to raise our thinking to the etheric level or just allow it to remain caught up in abstract thinking, which is bound to this double and the electromagnetic forces within the organism. So this is where this battle between the Christ on the one hand and the sun demon on the other. They battle within the human being and also in our solar system. We're really a fourfold human being. And in the daytime when they're together, due to a loosening of the etheric, a new clairvoyance is being born. But if we fall under the spell of the gravity forces, then we instead partake of a relationship to the double and strengthen that. The ancients had some wisdom to share and these images 
were expressions of how the whole universe is really a musical instrument and that this also lives in the microcosm. Johannes Kepler in his uh, writings, Harmonica Mundi, his five books uh, relates to this theme. And there's other chemists, for example, like this Alexander Reyna Newlands, who saw the octaves manifest in the elemental table. Here is uh, Rudolf Hauschka speaking of this. If the chemical elements are arranged in a sequence based on a scale of increased atomic weights, their characteristic qualities reappear in definite intervals. The significant fact discovered in the series is that matter is subject to a rhythmic ordering. It is really not surprising that the law of single and multiple proportion, which defines the rhythmic character of matter, reappears in essence in a new metamorphosis as Newland's law of octaves. This law was later developed by Meyer and Mendeleff into the periodic table of the elements. The rhythmic characteristic of substances and processes as found in chemistry are very like the rhythmic periodicities found in music. Anyways, uh, music is frozen in matter. And Hans Jenny showed this visibly in his devices. He shows the dance of matter, the sound waves, uh, the acoustic sound phenomena. Rudolf Steiner encouraged scientists to study rhythm. Rhythm carries life. So in the mystery dramas, Rudolf Steiner uh, depicted a new technology or dramatically uh, in the figure of Strader, who had developed a technology, at least uh, prototypes that would begin to work with human etheric uh, forces. And there's many places where Rudolf Steiner speaks further of this. He shows, uh, for example, how John Worrell Keeley was a pioneer of these forces and created machines in this direction. But he wasn't develop, uh, able to develop beyond uh, prototypes uh, that could work for other people. It was really only when he was present and uh, when others were there, if he put his hand on their shoulder, for example. So he had this force uh, that can be the basis of a future technology. So here we have this seal in the middle and Steiner speaks of how these pillars of Yachim and Boaz were embodied in certain individual that the Yachim pillar, the red pillar related to the oxygenated blood is related to Leo Tolstoy. He was mainly towards the end of his life turning to the inner life and turning away from the outer life. Rudolf Steiner identifies John Worrell Keeley with the Boaz pillar, the blue carbonated uh, blood pillar. This has to do with the transition from death into the macrocosmic world, whereas the Yachim pillar has to do with moving from the spiritual world down into the physical. So when we move in this other direction, the Boaz pillar, which Keeley was involved with, we come up against the Lord of Death, Ariman, who took a particular interest in Steiner's mystery drama, the fourth one, especially in Strader's work and helped to interfere with the potential realization of that technology. So how do we get there to work with these energies? Projective geometry is one that Steiner pointed to. This is sort of an exercise of living into the etheric, into this world of counter space. 
into negative space as opposed to positive space where matter and gravity are present. And the plant is the embodiment of these etheric forces. And George Adams and Oliver Vischer did a great job of introducing this subject. So Christ in the etheric is the antidote to all of the negative forces I've brought up in this presentation. And this second coming is taking place in the etheric and it works through the four types of ethers related to earth, air, water, fire, and the four types of elemental beings related to them, the knowns and the undines to water and the sylphs to air and the gnomes to earth. We need to disenchant these beings. They are waiting for their liberation so that they can contribute to the emergence of the future New Jerusalem. But if instead we look at matter as made up of atoms and electromagnetic forces and nuclear forces, we are actually delivering these elemental beings to be devoured by the dragon and contribute instead to the eighth sphere. So sorry to uh, try your patience with this le lengthy uh, presentation. But if we have uh, uh, more time, we could open it to contributions or questions that people might have. Gloria, thank you very much for your intensive presentation. And uh, it looks like we're gonna take maybe four or five minutes break to have a sip of water and move around and uh, we're going to be back for answers and for questions and answers section. Um, so dear friends, let's take a break and we will be back in four or five minutes to ask questions. Thank you. Can you hear me, uh, Andre? Yes, 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 yes. You can hear me? Yes, yeah, I can. Okay. Are you feeling, are you fresh? <laughs> yeah, I maybe go uh, just for a second to see what's happening with my chickens out in the back. <laughs> I'll sure. be right back. Sure. Okay. Yeah. We will wait. Mm.
So, dear friends, we are back. Uh -huh. Lauren, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, excellent. Uh -huh. so dear friends, uh, I noticed many of you join us uh, about 40 minutes later or 30 minutes later. So the session will be uploaded, so it's recorded. And um, I just typed and um, uh, the address of our website in the chat window. So I hope tomorrow, or maybe, yeah, I hope tomorrow you can you can view lecture of uh, of uh, Florian. I so can also now, say. Uh, that I'd be ready to share the slides uh, for those who are interested. They could email me at florianseido at gmail.com. Yeah, can, can you please type it in the chat window so people can copy and paste it? So Florian is um, uh, typing his uh, email. Uh, let's see. And um, uh, Florian, could you just do it in a PDF format, uh, all your slideshow? Sure. Because not everyone has uh, PowerPoint. So it's a great number of slides, so 30 or so. Okay, uh, and now we are ready to move into conversation. So please find in the bottom of your screen, uh reactions there are symbol reactions and click on it and uh, there is raise a hand raise hand button and uh yeah who will be first please click on it and ask your question I have a question. This is Ricardo. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you, yeah. can you hear me? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Hi, Ricardo. Yeah. Hi, Florian. It's a, it's a, a great uh, talk, but it was really fast. So, if you could elaborate a little bit more on how practically we can effectively work against um, our man's incarnation and the double and the effect in our culture. Um, I know the etheric crisis is really important to that for that, but um, you know what? What are we really supposed to do on a more cultural scale? Uh, given that it seems overwhelming, uh, we just focus on having little communities ourselves. And our, you know, our branch groups and stuff, or uh, how do we then relate to the larger culture? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the things is, of course, the inner side of it, which is the meditative life, uh, the taking in of spiritual wisdom. Anthroposophy is like a nourishing uh, nourishment for the soul that we need to help awaken us in the midst of all of these forces in mass media culture that want to put us to sleep. And uh, Rudolf Steiner gives this picture of Ariman coming from below. It, this is in Michaelmas as uh, all forces of man. He there speaks of how the Arimanic uh, forces, which in other places he says arise through the feet. That's why uh, Peter, when he was uh, asked to participate in this washing of the feet, he saw it as condescending, so he didn't 
uh, want to do it, but he was told if I don't wash your feet, you'll have no part in me. And he said, then wash my whole body. He said, no, I only have to wash your feet. So we have beneath our feet this world of subnature, the nine layers of the interior of the earth, also called the hell regions. And the subnature, like electricity, always wants to go into the ground. It belongs in that underworld. But we've mistakenly identified the world of light uh, that awakens the beauty and the life of the plant with electricity and the electromagnetic spectrum, but this is not true. And so uh, these arimonic forces on the inner level rise up. And as long as we have the luciferic in our head, which inspires pride and this sort of one-sided otherworldliness that the new age movement tends to be very uh, involved with that came about in the 60s and mixed in uh, music, uh, rock music and drugs and all of this, uh, that uh, is not the real orientation to the spiritual world as many of you know, uh, that as long as the luciferic is there in our heads, the arimonic seeks to rise up and is then invited into the head from below. And he says, if the Christ isn't there in the middle, in the heart, the rhythmic system, and he says, everything depends on that, then Ariman can actually take hold of the thinking and drag it down. And that the earth is dying. So the electromagnetic forces in the environment are increasing, not just through our propagation, but part of a natural process. And the double, which is geographic, the United States is sort of the epicenter of Ariman's working. That's why there's an expectation of Ariman to incarnate in America, uh, because uh, it's especially where the North South mountain ranges run on the West coast of the United States and running up into the Rockies in Canada and the Andes in South America, where the uh, earth forces of magnetism are aligned to the north-south direction. And of course, Silicon Valley is located there. And you've got uh, Gates Empire located there up in the Seattle area. And you have Hollywood and the like. Uh, and there's a saying that what happens in California leads the nation. And so you have the whole of the United States, you have these forces being more powerful than in other geographic locations. The magnetic north is in the north of Canada and the uranium uh, ores that are found, a lot of them are found in these regions. Uh, so these forces resonate with the double. So we have to work that much harder in this geographic area for those who live in America. Hawaii, where I live, is a little different. It has a di different geographic, uh, more warmth ether and light ether, as opposed to the life and uh, chemical ether touches the uh, coast of America. But in the uh, Atlantic Ocean, you have a classic mid-oceanic ridge where new matter arises out of that mid-oceanic ridge and spreads both ways where the plates of the earth spread. But in the Pacific where I'm living, where Andre and Allah just visited, uh, this is surrounded by the ring of fire. This is where the moon exited from the earth and left that wound behind. And so that mid-oceanic ridge isn't there in this region. Instead, it got displaced to the east and actually moves on to land in New Mexico and up into California. And so this is an area where you have magnetic anomalies, which Steiner referred to as especially important to study. These are propitious for the working of the double, the doppelganger. And so Silicon Valley is uh, suited for these kind of inventions. 
but anyways, I think limiting our uh, media exposure uh, without uh, you know turning away from it. But uh, like I have in my backyard, uh, a garden, I've got some compost uh, that I'm doing. I got some chickens that uh, uh, grew up from little chicks, deliver eggs every day and try to get some connection to the land. I'm also trying to ground myself by working with architecture and design and bring beauty in because truth, beauty and goodness are related to head, heart, and will, science, art, and religion. They need to complement each other. So they, to create a sacred space, that's where uh, sacramentalization needs to happen in the sphere of technology, according to Steiner. The work table needs to become like an altar. But in the cultural life, celebrating the festivals are primary because uh, this is the way to impact the organ that I've spoken of in previous lectures at the center of the earth, which corresponds to the pineal gland, according to my research. That's where the Christ has anchored himself as the planetary spirit, and this etheric aura of the earth uh, extends out from there, and the plants have their ego there. But this is also the center of the hell regions, the ninth layer. So there's a battle there and through the festivals, we can influence, we can help the, the light of that center to grow so that the power of the second coming reaches more human beings. The night day rhythm is another one. So the festivals can be carried into the anthroposophical uh, work and uh, bringing all the arts together that are available. So uh, the Raphael being the grail uh, quest, these are all very important uh, counterparts to these technologies. So I'll leave that to that at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, so dear friends, who will be next? Oh, Helena, Helena, I can see your hand. hand. Yeah, go ahead. Helena, please unmute your mic. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay, excellent. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes perfect. Oh, good. Uh, can you say a little bit more when you mentioned that the star? above the white house is upside down. Okay. Yeah, if, uh, if you stand in the form of the pentagram, like in a Eurythmy exercise, uh, the etheric forces based on Steiner's indications uh, come from above through the head to the right foot, to the left hand, to the right hand, uh, down to the left foot and back up. Yeah. And that in that one picture uh, that I showed, the slide where I showed the mothers, there was a fruit, so to speak, of that tree of life that was growing above this cross of the mystery of Golgotha. And on the right side of that slide, I showed the pentagram surrounded by a pentagon, surrounded by a circle. In the lecture series, The Wonders of the World, Rudolf Steiner gives that image and he says that it expresses in geometric form the proportional relationship between the four aspects of the human being. So the astral body is expressed by the pentagon, the pentagonal form. The etheric body by the pentagram, which is inside of that. And then surrounding the whole is a circle, which represents the ego that encompasses all 
of the four. But inside of that pentagram is another pentagon that is upside down. This is related to the physical body. When Ariman enters through the feet, he can only rise as high as the sexual forces. And it's from there that he seeks to pull the head forces down. And of course, Darwinism, which says we're just higher animals, helps that to happen. And so Ariman is akin to our lower nature. And we uh, need to, uh, you could say, look up to this image of Michael, who puts the dragon beneath his feet. And in this same lecture series, Michael Mass and the Soul Forces of Man, uh, Rudolf Steiner so. there speaks of how the Michael being needs to be imagined behind your head, above your head and behind your head, a kind of etheric image of Michael that we see the spiritual world through the back of the head. In a previous uh, set of talks, I showed how the Gertianum, the cross section of it, can be related to the human head. And the little cupola is where the sculptural group was meant to be, which hadn't been placed yet. The speaker podium is in front of that. There's 12 uh, sort of thrones there. And that represents the back of the head. So the spiritual is manifesting through that sculptural group and telling us about the mystery of evil. And up above, there was a painting in the cupola with the same theme, Christ balancing Lucifer and Ariman. But with this Ariman coming from below, Lucifer coming through the head forces above, inspiring pride and this thinking of we don't, we're gods ourselves. Uh, this means that Christ isn't in the middle. So mm -hmm. what happens when Christ isn't in the middle? What happens is that the Azuric beings who attack the ego take up that space in the middle. So behind the feminine gender is the Luciferic double or tempter. Behind the masculine is more the Arimanic tempter. But uh, Zurich beings who come into their own in our time attack through sexuality and they attack the ego itself and they tear pieces out of it that are ir irredeemably lost. Unlike Lucifer, whose attacks can be healed through sickness, Ariman, whose attacks can be healed over time through karma, reincarnation, and working out our karmic debts with others. But this Azuric attack, we can't. And it's from America that these forces spread out. And instead of turning love upward, the Azuric beings turn it downward towards the interior of the earth. And there you get sadomasochistic tendencies. So human beings who take those up instead of after death, experiencing the pain they caused others as a redemptive sort of uh, period of purgatory where we're purging away what held us back from the spiritual world. If you've taken pleasure in the pain of others, you are instead going down into the abyss in the interior of the earth. You become a black magician and black magic is related to sexual magic. So anyways, the upside down, uh, five-pointed star, if you turn it upside down, you could fit into it the goat head, which is sometimes used. And the horns represent the horns of the two-horned beast. And the black magician uses those two horns to influence others from the level of the will, from the unconscious. So anyways, the upside down uh, five-pointed star is the danger in our fifth age, where we need to orient it upward to reconnect with the spiritual world, which begins with the etheric. So working with 
uh, eurythmy is a very valuable uh, means of working. And water fluid is the medium of the etheric in our body, taking in quality water and having our thinking become more able to flow like water, to live into rhythm and uh, penetrate the mysteries of life, which the plants embody, the animals embody, the human beings embody. Thank you so, so I'll leave much. It at that for that Can question. you please give me beyond. the date of the lecture? Sarah? Is it, is it question to me or to Florian? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just would like the date of the lecture, what you oh. mentioned. The name of the lecture? Yeah, uh, uh, the date, if I have the date. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear it. Can you? Uh, Helena needs some date, date and uh, uh, title of lecture, what you mentioned. Okay, yeah, these, uh, there were lectures I gave at the Anthroposophical uh, uh, Society through the same kind of Zoom format earlier this year. Uh, and one of those is recorded on Zoom uh, uh, that's posted there. Uh, the other one I could share uh, the slides. Uh, I don't have a recording of it. Uh, myself that one, but there were two that I gave there. Both of them touch on these same areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So dear friends, more questions. Okay, I have a question. Um, so um, Hawaii Islands, they are part of US but you have uh, a separate society, anthroposophical society in Hawaii. And um, I would say um, in terms of uh, geography, spiritual geography, it's a present absolutely different world, absolutely different region. But my question, what is spiritual mission maybe of society of Hawaii to anthroposophical society in America? Rudolf Steiner indicated uh, that in his time, a shift uh, was underway of the center of gravity of world civilization, that this center of gravity of world civilization was moving already in his time from the Black Sea, from the European theater, to the Pacific Ocean, and that this would give rise to the emergence of a world culture in the Pacific. So here in the Pacific, East and West meet in a very different way. In Europe, you have the East that is East of Europe. Here we have the East is West of us and mainland America is east of us. So things are reversed. And back then you had European colonialism. Uh, India became the crown jewel of the English colonialism. And of course, other countries in Africa, in the Arab world were part of these colonial endeavors. And of course the world wars, uh, the first and Second World Wars were carried out in those regions and America became involved. And there was then a shift uh, to America as became the superpower uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So America has the Atlantic on one side, the Pacific on the other, and it's become the lone superpower. And uh, on the one hand, America does trade and relationships across the Atlantic to the Europeans, 
we're seeing that play out, for example, in the war in Ukraine, where uh, America is allied to other uh, European countries in NATO and uh, are supplying weapons. So it's kind of a surrogate war that's going on uh, over there to try to weaken uh, Russia. Uh, and of course, Putin is ambitious to re uh, uh, bring about the great Soviet Union that he thinks it was a mistake uh, that allowed it to collapse. But on other side of America is the Pacific. And if you look at world trade, there's more world trade now going on between America and Asia across the Pacific than there is uh, with America across the Atlantic. So on the economic level, that Pacific shift has begun uh, for some time now. Another aspect of that is the rise of the Asian tigers in the world economy. So Japan played a role a while back. You got South Korea playing a big role in technology. Uh, but more recently, it's the rise of China. China has become a world power that's now uh, seeking to advance through technology to bypass the United States in various areas. And just like Russia has been invading Ukraine and already has taken part of that land in the 2014, uh, that you have China has its eyes on Taiwan. Taiwan uh, produces about 92% of the very high end microchips. And this battle right now, the third world war has already begun in terms of trade wars, technology world, wars, Yahweh, uh, this uh, Huawei, this, uh, 5G uh, Chinese company, uh, the CEO was uh, detained in Canada and on trial for going against US uh, sanctions with Iran and, and others. And uh, this is just the beginning of these kinds of technology wars, for example, uh, the machine that's needed to produce the highest level of microprocessor computer chips is from a company in Holland. Uh, Taiwan has these to produce their chips, but China is being uh, withheld. They're being withheld from China through the US putting pressure on this company. So we in the Pacific, we're in the middle of the Pacific and there's this tension that's building between America and China. And uh, China, if you look at the way technologies are being used in terms of surveillance in China as a, an authoritarian society that is now shifting to the digital yuan, which is digital money, where everything will be centralized and recorded. And they have, uh, just like when you wanna buy a house, you've gotta get a credit rating. They have kind of a ethical credit rating, a kind of moral grading of people. So if you make some mistakes as a young person, uh, speeding, jaywalking, uh, all these uh, uh, things that you might get yourself into, those are points that show up on this sort of report card of sorts. And then uh, certain benefits are withheld. So we've got the US that seeks to uh, form you know, a government that respects freedom. It's very far from succeeding in that, but there's still a greater freedom of press, et cetera, China, uh, it's mainly the Communist Party and its uh, dogma 
uh, or ideology that is transmitted through the press. Uh, there's no opposition parties uh, of any sort. We can see what happened in Hong Kong. So we're in the midst of a tension here in the Pacific and Steiner warned in the past that if a spiritual dimension isn't added to the physical, uh, political, economic relations between East and West that work across the Pacific, then there would be war in the Pacific. So the Taiwan invasion of the future could end up being that kind of a war theater that spills over into our region and affects world trade. Uh, will heavily impact Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, and uh, America uh, seeks uh, through Guam and other places. So we're uh, on an island that has Pearl Harbor, which is where the, the American Navy has a big presence and nuclear submarines. And so we need to try to do what we can to do our soul spiritual work that anthroposophy helps to inspire. And ideally we could have gatherings and meetings here in Hawaii where representatives of this stream from these different countries around the Pacific could meet. And ideally these Zoom sessions uh, in the future could include people from the Asia Pacific uh, so that a dialogue can open up and we can bring this spiritual dimension into this space. But Hawaii has a different etheric geography. It's easier to connect with the etheric here. There's three harvests a year uh, that can happen if you're good at agriculture. That's why uh, these companies that wanna do a 12 year trial, cut it down to four by doing three trials a, do, a year here with their genetic engineering. So uh, <laughs> there's those kind of things happening, but they don't tell you where their plots are. Otherwise people would be over there protesting. But anyways, it's a very mixed uh, picture. Again, the, most, the moon will eventually reconnect with the earth. And so we have to do our homework in the meantime, everybody, uh, has been hearing about these uh, spider-like beings and all of uh, this uh, abstract thinking that's embodied in these machines and the internet taking on physical form when the moon reconnects at a time around the eighth millennium. Well, what we need to do in the meantime is reconnect with the stars, experience the etheric and the astral uh, world of the stars look at the human being in a way that experiences the etheric and the astral and the ego within us and uh, push back against this scientific way of looking at things. Thank you very much, Florian. Uh, dear friends, more questions. Hello, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, in the announcement you you also mentioned UFOs. Any small comment on that one from your point of view? Yeah, I, I obviously had too many things uh, I was trying to share. So originally I had hoped when I was bringing up uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and these space endeavors to also touch on UFOs. And of course, uh, the fact that the US is creating this uh, uh, space force uh, that was launched in uh, the last presidency uh, is a, sort of a Star Wars-like scenario uh, coming to expression uh, on the earthly plane here. And Every, just like I say, Monday, Artemis is going up. Today, uh, a SpaceX rocket is going up or has gone uh, delivering satellites. Uh, a lot of what UFO phenomena are related to are very fuzzy 
in the way that they are described in physical terms. That uh, various people, C.G. Jung, uh, Georg Unger, uh, who was the head of the science section, wrote a little booklet on the subject. And uh, others have made contributions uh, in uh, book East in the Light of the West by Prokofiev. I think it's like three volumes in German. Also, there's an English uh, version, but it's, I think, shorter, doesn't include the whole thing. There is uh, a section on the rerics and their Agni Yoga. And during that uh, part of the book, it's uh, touched upon that in this Himalaya region, there was a spiritual center uh, where this lodge of the masters, a kind of spiritual ashram that some of these uh, spiritual leaders sought to find and connect. And he speaks there of how there was UFO-like phenomena uh, that was related to this place, uh, meaning there were disks of light and that sort of thing. And uh, Prokofiev relates this to the eighth sphere. Now, Rudolf Steiner indicated that what happens uh, in regard to the eighth sphere is that there is a battle that goes on with every morsel of materiality. The spirits of form, also called the exousiae, uh, are the main progenitors of the earth phase of evolution, the Elohim. One of those Elohim remained behind as Yahweh when the moon uh, uh, and the earth separated from the sun where the other six Elohim uh, departed during the uh, recapitulation of the old sun. And that's the Hyperborean phase. And then in Lemuria, the moon was taken out by Yahweh. And the spirits of form represent all seven of those. Elohim. The six Elohim, aside from Yahweh, entered the man Jesus in the 30th year at the baptism, and then gradually over those three years incorporated their uh, fullness into that body and went through the mystery of Golgotha and united with the earth. So these Elohim exousiae, spirits of form, are the beings who through a sacrifice laid the foundations for the earth development and they're the ones who give the human ego to humanity. And the, these phenomena, every morsel of matter, Steiner indicates there's a battle where Lucifer and Ariman battle with the spirits of form to take that substance and carry it away into their eighth sphere. And in as much as they're successful, the eighth sphere grows and parts of human beings, especially he mentions the attack on the head or anything that's like the head, they're most successful in tearing pieces away uh, from the spirits of form. And partly that's helped us to become free, but there's a limit there at a point where this is exactly what these Luciferian Arimonic beings are seeking to do is to deny our freedom. So if they succeed in pulling us into that sphere, which Steiner said, as soon as anthroposophists start saying, uh, Rudolf Steiner said, we should do this, then Rudolf Steiner becomes a spiritual authority. This is leading matter over into the eighth sphere. So I had a, a, a bird out at Kahumana 
that uh, uh, was a minor bird and minor birds, you can teach them to speak a little bit. So I taught them to say, Rudolf Steiner said, Steiner said, Steiner said, Steiner said, and some of the birds started saying Steiner said, to remind me of that uh, issue. But anyways, uh, these, uh, this eight sphere, when you hear descriptions of it, is it's, it's a spectral world. It's not spiritual, it's a materialized spirituality. So the double is, you could say, akin to that eighth sphere. The electromagnetic forces are akin to the eighth sphere. Uh, and these, uh, these fallen ethers are related to the eighth sphere. So uh, when we look at matter as being uh, in modern science uh, formed from atoms and the atoms are reducible to the atomic nucleus, which has a positive charge and then a neutron, which is neutral, but has electrons around it. And in that musical picture, I was trying to bring at the end, you have the two ends of the elemental table. The hydrogen is the lighter elements. Uh, most of the universe is hydrogen. But on the other is the uranium end, which is the heaviest. So these are like the light note and the dark note. And so it's like a little kid playing on a piano. We're, we're pushing those notes because those are the boundary between the physical and the other side. And so that's where we have fission as a nuclear force and fusion that's sort of being uh, sought as a new form of, of energy that some companies think they're close to. So a lot of the UFO phenomena has those characteristics that it's not spiritual, it's a, a imagination overlaying certain experiences that has a, a spectral kind of ghostly component in this view that I've uh, developed so that you have imagination with the help of uh, natural science has engendered science fiction. Science fiction is coming into play in movies, uh, and more and more uh, UFO sightings arose during the time when human beings had begun to fly airplanes and have uh, military airplanes and the like. And there was uh, warfare with airplanes. And so we had start to move technology from the earth to the air. And then science fiction, uh, already in the Royal Society uh, was feeding uh, the imagination of uh, new technologies uh, in the new Atlantis of Francis Bacon. An earlier figure, Roger Bacon also, uh, Steiner said was inspired by Gundy Shapur and talks about a lot of these uh, devices uh, that are futuristic at the time. So this, uh, loosening of the ether body that's been happening in the head since the Greco-Latin time and in the heart more recently, this is bringing about a natural clairvoyance. So humanity is crossing the threshold. We're already on the other side since the 1840s and we're starting to have experiences. But the knowledge we bring with us is what we project into those worlds. So if we've been fed modern science and we embrace it and believe it, and we've ingested uh, science fiction like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, it gets into our will and you wanna embody it. You wanna go to Mars, you start propagating those imaginations uh, with your billions of dollars to bring them to realization. So I think all of these things together, the science fiction, the movies, uh, the futuristic looking uh, acceleration and uh, Star Wars, Star Trek, uh, growing up with that, that set the stage for a lot of this. But when you investigate the material, 
you find that there's not a whole lot to be seen on the purely level, except if you get into a lot of uh, groups that are not reliable in terms of their uh, kind of evidence. So a lot of psychic phenomena, spiritual experiences that are misinterpreted and the like, because there are intelligence in the universe, uh, but aliens are related to our own alienation from those cosmic intelligence. Not to say that there isn't the possibility of these uh, sorts of things in the future, but up till now, what evidence I've been able to see is in the category I've been describing. Thank you very much. Uh, so dear friends, we already working for two hours and 12 minutes. Uh, Florian, how do you feel? Can we take one more question? So sure, I, I wanted to make sure that my uh, email address, I, I don't have my how to type yeah, on I this just thing at the I moment. Just posted. I just it's posted. just my name at gmail.com. It's right there. It's uh, in the... Um, okay. In the, in, the, in the chat box, I mean. Yeah, I'm fine box. for a further question. Oh my God, it's two already. So, but we probably will be okay with one, which is from Mikael and Victoria. Yeah, two Sorry. is fine, whatever. Two is fine, okay. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, actually it's uh, Leo. I'm here with Mikaela, uh, my my wife. But oh. um, um, yeah, my question was uh, in my limited uh, experience, I noticed kind of uh, two rough uh, trends in anthroposophical groups. Uh, one is try to avoid as much as reasonably possible the contact with uh, technology or adopting new technologies. The other, mainly younger people, trying to uh, bring, adopt technology and, and try to inject anthroposophical values into it. Um, obviously, it's not either or, uh, but you can see a little bit the, the possibility of diluting anthrop uh, anthroposophy or on, on one hand or on the other, uh, having groups that end up being isolated from uh, mainstream culture or not participating in mainstream culture. So I was wondering, since uh, you've been studying and observing, if you had uh, had been able to, to observe any examples uh, where either of these uh, approaches were successful or even unsuccessful. But from, from experience, if you've seen uh, any anything that I could uh, further look into to, to, as an example of, okay, anthroposophy actually successfully uh, getting involved in technology and somehow redeeming some of these dangers that you've been uh, telling us about, or, or where, you know, groups kind of isolated themselves and that actually uh, made a, a, a positive, uh, it, it, yeah, somehow ended up being a positive uh, influence in evolution or the world or culture at any scale. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think uh, uh, John Wilkes, uh, for example, was someone who developed the flow forms. He's uh, have passed away a while back uh, or crossed the threshold. Uh, but he studied uh, sculpture and he studied Rudolf Steiner's sculptural group and helped to do repairs on the model, et cetera. And that helped uh, to inspire him in the direction of these uh, flow forms. And uh, that spread in many directions, I think in a positive way because uh, uh, water uh, is uh, a medium that can help to awaken a sense for the etheric and it's used, they have workhorse types that are used to purify water, uh, 
that uh, they also have uh, types uh, that are used in playgrounds for children to play with. Uh, you can have them in your office, a small version. Uh, there's many different applications, but the idea is that through water moving in the vortex, and usually the flow form will have a reverse vortex a back and forth like a lemniscate figure eight in each basin. And that is a way of drawing etheric forces into the water, just like when you're doing biodynamic preparation, you're stirring it. Now, biodynamics is another area where aside from the small farm where you stir the preparation, like the preparation 500, uh, the old way where people in the tradition used to sing while they were doing it. Uh, you're stirring one way very vigorously, then stirring the other way. And you're often at it for an hour. Some people take turns doing it. And uh, then you spread it on the field, etc. cetera. Uh, there's people who have developed uh, ways of uh, using machines to uh, do the mixing. And there's people who've also used airplanes to spread and they've developed devices uh, to do this. There is a, uh, 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 Shad, uh, what's his name? Anyways, there's a, another fellow who developed a, a mixing machine uh, that uh, is being used commercially that's quite special. Um, I have you know, various books from this author. It's all in German mostly, but uh, uh, this machine is quite sophisticated. They're also uh, doing offshoots of it for propellers on boats. Uh, it's used for mixing all kinds of materials in medicine on a, you know, maybe smaller scale, etc. And then, you know, there's people like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Paul Emerson. Paul Emerson has specialized in this area of uh, studying and seeking to bring to realization this etheric technology that Steiner spoke of. And he attracted funding from various sources. He had his first center in France uh, and a land that also had an old age home, created a special building that shut out uh, electromagnetic fields that was seven sided where they did experimentations uh, in this direction. More recently, they acquired land in Scotland. He's written uh, numerous books. Uh, one is called From Gundi Shapur to Silicon Valley. Uh, the two volumes have been published, several of them in later editions to the first one. The third volume was underway when he passed away a few years ago. And they have uh, in this uh, place in Scotland, a lot of land. They've got uh, uh, agriculture going on. They have places uh, uh, where they have um, engineering work going on. They created a device called the Harmonium uh, based on uh, Paul Emerson's sort of research. Uh, but it never really got to functioning uh, in terms of uh, the prototype. And one of the things is that uh, Paul Emerson uh, looked at computers as being a very sort of a dangerous uh, technology for human beings and uh, the internet in general. So he and the group around him has avoided using these technologies. So getting a hold of the books by Paul Emerson is not an easy task. Uh, so it's not the best way if you want to propagate knowledge to not use the technology. I, I disagree with 
that approach because I think it has uh, something that harkens back to the Essenes. The Essenes, uh, as you know, were a pre-Christian community that harkened back to Jeshu Ben Pandira and other inspirers of that movement. And John the Baptist was closely associated with the Essenes. And Steiner uh, indicated that they had purified their own souls as a community, as individuals. They had a very high standard of moral development within their community, very self-disciplined. But they kept the evil pushed out of their gates. But he says, all the more did it attack the people outside of their gates. And so that's a first phase. I tried to show in a previous slide in an earlier presentation, the initiation of Parsival from an esoteric lesson. And Parsival uh, stands in this five-pointed star and there's a lot to it. It's worth contemplating, but he first sees a tree with a giant lily growing out of it. And he hears a voice from Blanche Fleur, the white flower that says, this thou art. But then he's led to noticing that there is a smell, not a very pleasant one around the outside of this blossom. So the this thou art is also related to that. And you could say this, this odor is to the flower what the pushing out of the evil within the Essene community is to those outside the community. The other side of, of the Christian impulse is the Manichaean one. Mani became Parsival. Parsival at first visited the Grail Castle and he didn't ask the question that should have arose out of compassion. Compassion is this empathy that we need to live into the suffering of others. And that's a part of bearing the cross. So in this initiation of Parsival, this lily disappears and a cross appears, a black cross. And then seven red roses are arrayed around the cross and another voice speaks. This is Fleur, says this thou art to become. So it's dying and becoming. The real Steiner's Rose Cross Meditation in uh, Cult Science and Outline or Esoteric Science and Outline uh, works with that meditative theme. So it's this dying to oneself and this blood becoming permeated with this new Christ impulse. And uh, I think uh, myself, these Zoom sessions have a value. Uh, people from all over the world can potentially participate if they have the technological means. Uh, we're not at a etheric level to where we can communicate with each other etherically at this point. And uh, just like an older person can use a crutch. Uh, my son has a prosthesis uh, because he lost his lower leg. That's a technological device. Those are getting more and more uh, sophisticated. People who uh, were sent to war and lose their limbs can have artificial limbs. That's on the way to becoming a cyborg, but uh, it's a therapeutic uh, impulse and intervention. So I think there's a lot of positive things. We shouldn't reject technology outright and uh, you know, turn away from it. We should try to limit our exposure to some of these influences. Like I uh, turn off our router at night uh, and turn it on when it, we're wanting to use it uh, because it radiates through the house. We don't have one of those uh, wireless phones because I had measuring devices and uh, I could measure the field, not just in my house, but across the street. That's how strong it was. And it was going 24 seven. So a lot of devices now are becoming wireless. There's smart meters, et cetera. And it's not bad to have a measuring device so you can measure high frequency, low frequency, 
uh, the old televisions sent radiations through the walls. If you had a bed on the other side, the person sleeping there would be radiated while it's on. Every outlet in a building, there's an electric field in it, regardless of whether you plug something in. And there's a magnetic field that's perpendicular to the uh, wire that's usually copper in there. And so uh, our houses are filled with these forces. And so if you want to create a meditative space that's conducive, sometimes you want to create a space where those forces aren't in your immediate area. So anyways, I think technology like uh, farmers in biodynamics, they use tractors, they use uh, plows, you know, et cetera. And I think uh, we need to uh, Rudolf Steiner used the latest technology and lighting on the stage. Hydraulics was used uh, for the plays to raise up something from below in the stage set. So uh, I think uh, the fact that Rudolf Steiner made a special building for the electrical generation that looked like it was a house for electricity. And the electricity was then from there uh, piped or uh, cabled into the sacred building for the lights rather than having the generators and this more powerful radiation in that sacred space. So we need to use our discernment on the levels of exposure. Nuclear energy is, of course, the worst. There's dangers right now in Ukraine where there's fighting around the biggest uh, nuclear uh, site for electrical uh, over there in Europe. And so uh, nuclear war is threatening with the bulletin of the scientists. Every uh, January, they put out a new uh, bulletin of where we are in terms of the danger of nuclear energy. And I think they put us 100 seconds from the midnight hour. Uh, this last time around. So that's the closest we've been to the danger of uh, nuclear. And of course, China and the US are both nuclear powers. And we're now developing hypersonic missiles on the Russians, Americans, Chinese. These arrive so quickly that human beings aren't in a position to monitor them. We need AI. Those AI devices are programmed by human beings who are fallible, can make mistakes in terms of programming. So even little mistakes of that sort could set off a third world war. <laughs> so technology is with us to stay and we can't run away from it. I use a car. I've got actually four screens here in front of me. Uh, so uh, each person has to discern what they can handle in terms of uh, the technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Florian, can we take one more? Sure. Okay, Victoria. Yeah, please unmute yourself and uh, go ahead. Hi, Florian. Hi, Andrea Hi. and everyone. Hello. Thank you Hello. so much. Thank you so much, Florian, for the for your presentation. It was very useful. Oh, very um, welcome. I have a question. You are sweating partly to Leo's question. But it is related with the if you can expand more on the current, if there is anyone or groups researching the the Strader machine, and and the use of this technology or the energy in that way, like a, if if you know of research on on that, on how we can understand better what Will Steiner was trying to explain us in that. Yeah, I think the. Uh, the work of Paul Emerson, I don't want to discount its value. I think in uh, he spent many years on this. He's also written a book on biodynamics uh, that was not totally complete, but that's published. Again, these books are very hard to get a hold of. For some reason, uh, they accept uh, having things sent by fax machines. 
So I guess that's where they draw the line, but they don't advertise on Amazon or anywhere like that. But you might find some of Paul Emerson's work on Amazon that others have sold or put up for sale. The new volumes are leather bound, they're hand printed, they're very uh, thick. The third volume is gonna come out anytime. So in that you find a lot of uh, material that relates to this theme. There is the science section in Dornach. They publish a uh, publication called Jupiter. And uh, there is one in particular that was devoted, I think it's, uh, I can't remember the, the year, uh, to this area. And that is available online. So if you uh, type into Google, God forbid, Rudolf Steiner on technology, uh, this uh, would probably show up in a PDF form. It's fairly lengthy. It draws on, it talks about Strader, the mystery play. Uh, it shares some information about uh, Paul Emerson. Uh, it also has disagreements with Paul Emerson that are voiced uh, by uh, quotes in that uh, text. Uh, there's a couple other writers. Uh, uh, they're not in English, though, in German that I've been working with that deal with this subject. Um, the uh, Georg Unger, uh, uh, he was the head of the science section. He's got, uh, you can find these, uh, I think some of these on uh, anthroposophy.org or uh, that website that has anthroposophical books on English. Uh, if you look under Georg Unger, that's spelled G-E-O-R-G -E and then Unger is U-N-G-E-R. He's got one on nuclear energy and the occult atom. He has another one on spiritual science and the new nature forces. Uh, he's also another one of his more lengthy books is uh, published. Uh, I don't have uh, the name of it is forming concepts in physics in English. Uh, that has some material that's worth looking into. An important book uh, by Rudolf Steiner is uh, the challenge, uh, the challenge of the times. Looks like it's backward. And another one that's worth reading is uh, The Secret uh, Brotherhoods. Uh, by Rudolf Steiner. I'm not sure why this is in backwards, I'm seeing it, but uh, it's called The Secret Brotherhoods and the Mystery of the Human Double uh, by Rudolf Steiner. It has lectures uh, from different periods. Another, uh, the, another thing is called The Schiller File. The Schiller and File uh, is in English. It includes quotes by various uh, authors who have worked with uh, technology, including uh, Aaron Feed Pfeiffer. Uh, the Hart Lectures by Aaron Feed Pfeiffer are valuable because he was one of the few people who asked questions. And there are some lectures by Aaron Feed Pfeiffer related to the theme of Strader and the mystery plays. Uh, that are worth uh, looking at. Some of these are hard to find. Then there's, uh, there was a science section in Britain that published for years, uh, but they stopped publishing. And so one has to find their older publications. 
And uh, some of those people have also uh, published books dealing with this subject. Uh, so I could try to put together a little bit of a bibliography uh, that deals with some of these things uh, that I could try to you know, make available uh, online uh, for people. Uh, that uh, people who can read German uh, would have access to a much wider uh, range of uh, these types of contributions. Thank you so much, Florian. Okay. Thank you very much. Dear friends, so we are working two hours and 37 minutes. And um, I would say, I think it's good time to uh, conclude our session and uh, say thank you to Florian for joining us and giving your generous, very detailed presentations as usual. Um, so uh, we are recording the session and um, so I put in the uh, chat box um, <clears throat> email of Florian. This is his personal email. So you can, you can send and requ request uh, for PDF copy of slides of this wonderful uh, lecture. And, um, and recording will appear probably tomorrow, if not tomorrow, maybe Monday on uh, our website, which is website of Rudolf Steiner branch in Chicago, United States. Again, thank you so much, dear friends for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Florian. Uh, and now please feel free, unmute your mics and uh, say thank you to Florian and we will finish. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for participating. Thank you, Florian. Thank you, Florian. Oh, Thank you welcome. very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Andre and Florian and the Sorry. Chicago branch. Thank you, Florian. Thank you all. Thank you, all. Thank you very much. Blessings, Flor Florian. Uh, blessings to you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thank, Thank you all. You. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye bye. <sighs> okay. All right. Take care, Florian. So I will talk to you. <laughs> you too. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. bye, -bye.